Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of the Wise Decision Maker Show, where we help you make the wisest and most profitable decisions. My name is Dr. Gleb Saborski. I'm the CEO of Disaster Avoidance Experts, the future work consultancy that sponsors the Wise Decision Maker Show. And today with me is Mike Benoit, who is the CMO of Assure. Mike, why don't you tell us a little bit about what Assure does? So Assure is a payroll and HR software company and HR services company. Uh, we have about 100,000 clients, uh, uh, domestic U.S., uh, and we pay about 1.7 million employees. Uh, I would say that we are the largest payroll company you've never heard of, uh, mm -hmm. because about 80% of those customers and employees that we pay are uh, indirect, where uh, you'll have small, mm -hmm. regional, or uh, vertical market niche payroll HR companies that license our software mm. and use our platform to run their payroll HR businesses. Excellent. And you recently put out a report trying to quantify some of the softer metrics of HR. So can you tell me a little bit about why you decided to do that and what some of the key findings from the report are? Yeah, you know, this is something I've I've wrestled with for a long time. So I'm I'm a I'm a sales and marketing guy by in my career. I've been in this industry for about 25 years. And when it comes to payroll, all, all companies have to have payroll, right? So mm -hmm. um, you know, when you're trying to talk to clients about, uh, you don't have to convince them to to automate because no one does payroll uh, on with paper and pencil anymore, right? Mm -hmm. It's really sure. explaining the differences of your service model, the software features, etc. When it comes to HR. The, the world of HR has just become so complex. I'd say uh, the last decade, but it's really accelerated uh, in the last five and COVID just really put, put mm. gas on, on the acceleration. If you go back to say 1928, the Fair Labor Standards Act passed. First, mm. first I'd say major legislation around HR laws, overtime mm. laws, child protection, minimum wage, things like that. Come into the 60s, it was about equality. Uh, Civil Rights Act, Title VII, you can't discriminate based on race, age, gender, et cetera, right? Fast forward to, say, the 70s, you had OSHA to make sure we have safe work environments. You, then in the 90s, Americans with Disabilities Act, uh, Affordable Care Act. So call it once a decade or so, there would be big federal laws that would be passed. Mm -hmm. It's not that it was easy for small businesses, but it was infrequent enough that you could adjust, right? But mm -hmm. now... Uh, that there, there are over, uh, for example, there are over 150 unique jurisdictions just for minimum wage because mm -hmm. increasingly states, counties, and now municipalities are passing their own versions of these formerly yeah. federal laws. So as a small business owner, you have to comply with the Federal Fair Labor Standards Act. You got to meet minimum wage requirements of your, say, local mm -hmm. county. You might have to have, uh, uh, manage uh, during the pandemic uh, certain restrictions from your local health uh, uh, advisor mm. or or mayor. Um, you might have layering on of taxing jurisdictions for special. Uh, it, it just mm. I, I call this the Cambrian explosion, if you will, mm -hmm. or if you remember your earth, your uh, middle school or earth science, the Cambrian explosion for everybody watching is when the fossil record explodes, right, from single celled uh, entities into what, what we consider the major branches of, of life forms today. We're seeing this Cambrian explosion of HR compliance and HR laws. Mm -hmm. All that said, the black and white nature of HR, you know, <laughs> is okay. We want to help small businesses stay compliant, yeah. but I, I've, my gut has always told me the biggest value we could provide is around "quote unquote" the soft stuff of mm -hmm. HR, helping people to attract talent, develop that talent, retain that talent, and get the most productivity from that talent. So, so that was really the the motivation, and, and we okay. set about creating a survey that would try to quantify that in in and really give us something demonstrable. Does HR do HR best practices actually have a correlation to revenue mm -hmm. growth? Excellent. And tell us a little bit about what you found with correlation or not between best yeah. practices and revenue growth. Yeah. So, so my gut said there would be one. Um, I had no idea how strong it would be. Um, so our survey, we got, uh, we surveyed uh, businesses under 500 employees, the majority of which are under 50 employees. We had 2,065 respondents. So a big sample set, uh, mm -hmm. statistically very significant. We asked 40 questions broken up into eight categories. 
from pre-employment to post-employment. So hiring, excuse me, recruiting, hiring, onboarding, compliance, performance management, development, retention, and post-employment. <laughs> so five questions of do you do this? Do you not do that? Uh, essentially the best practices, five best mm -hmm. practices of each of those eight categories. We asked one last question after those 40 questions. What best describes your business last year? Was it a down year? Were you flat? Mm -hmm. Did you grow or did you have fast growth? And so then we unpack all this data and then correlate. You can imagine a chart that uh, my Y axis, if you will, is I, somebody answered yes to zero questions or yes to 40 questions. So that's my Y axis. My X axis being shrinking companies, flat companies, growth companies, and fast growth companies. And I'd say the first thing that really emerged was that on your down year shrinking companies, mm -hmm. there's like actually 1% of those companies, they said yes to all 40. Um, so it, uh, at, at the first jump, you see this giant spread where it, it's a sprinkling across. We have one, a, a chart in the ebook that you can download. Um, it's one dot per 2,065 companies. And, mm -hmm. and what you see is this obvious spread about the down year companies that HR obviously doesn't guarantee your success because some people do HR right. Some people in down years do HR poorly, but it's kind of all over the place. But when you look at the fast growth companies, Mm -hmm. It's literally 91% of all fast growth companies implement at least 50% of the best practices. Hmm. And so, so, that, so it's like you see this bunch of dots that kind of go up into the right in a, in a vacuum in the lower right, meaning the fast growth companies, they essentially don't do anything wrong in HR. So mm -hmm. the conclusion I drew was HR may not guarantee revenue growth. Mm -hmm. but it's an insurance policy that prevents a down year. Does that make sense? Makes sense. How do you address the issue of causation correlation? Like, is it companies that have more money that are faster growing that can afford to invest into good HR practices versus so, companies that are, yeah. So so I didn't ask, so across 2,000 customer, so this is, a, a, this is our 15,000 customers that I asked these questions of. Uh, of, of our uh, 50,000 out of our direct customers of the of our 100,000 total. Um, and so our customer base, we don't have more than 10% concentration in any industry. So I knew it'd be a, a broad sample of all of all in industries. I, I would say this, the survey results represent Main Street businesses, mm -hmm. Main, Main Street small business. Um, and I think there's some buckets that are, it's just obvious. What are the big drivers of revenue growth? Mm -hmm. Do you have a good product? I mean, if your product stinks, you're not going to grow. What sure. mar market demand? I mean, if you were selling Zoom uh, video conferencing during the pandemic, you know, pretty That's good. If, if you were a movie theater during the pandemic, not so much, right? So your product matters, market demand matters, the the quality of your competitors matters, access to capital. What we just said that that matters. What we found was when I took the average responses. So I, I talked about this kind mm -hmm. of scattergram. Um, the, the next layer we unfold in the report shows actual average responses of these down year flat growth and, and fast growth. And what mm -hmm. we saw was a 0.745 correlation from saying yes, that we in, we do HR these HR best practices to being a growth company. It doesn't say mm -hmm. how much they grew, mm -hmm. but to me, I was just blown away. I, I assumed there'd be mm -hmm. A, a tilting up, there would be some type of a positive correlation. Mm -hmm. But when I when I think about all of the things that impact revenue growth, to be a 0.745 just was mm -hmm. kind of astounding to me that it really is all about the people. Mm -hmm. it makes sense also that uh, you know with causation correlation, it's always an issue, but it probably takes a while to put in some of these practices. So you can't just easily put them in and take them out if you can't afford them, right? So you're going to, if you have those practices, then it's going to be, they're going to last for longer than a year. So that's- well, it, uh, and, and, and I'll give you an example. I'll just read you a couple. So like a, the, the section yeah. for development, um, mm -hmm. some things don't cost any money, you know? So it's, do you provide regular structured training for employees to be more effective in their jobs? 
Mm -hmm. Do you provide leadership training for managers? Do you provide additional on-demand training resources for employees? Do you frequently assign stretch assignments to your employees? And number five, do, you, do managers create written development plans for each employee? So mm -hmm. really, truly HR best practices that don't have to cost money per se. Mm -hmm. one, one of the things that kind of uh, I, I really wrestled with is as I'm digesting all this, I'm like, because I was kind of blown away by the 0.745 of the positive correlation. Yeah, that's very strong. Yeah. Uh, and I'm like, okay, am I overstating this? Because there may not be a causal relationship, right? Well, so that's Cause, the causation correlation question, right? The, right, right. And so it got me thinking, it's like, okay, are these companies growing because they implemented the HR best practices? Mm -hmm. Or is it they're just really well-run companies and therefore really well-run companies implement HR best practices? And I think, and I'd be curious for your opinion, because I mean, you're, you're, you're a data guy, uh, read, read your books and, and mm -hmm. consume your content. In this context, I, I wonder if it almost doesn't matter because the correlation is the correlation. And if whether or not the chicken caused the egg or the egg caused the chicken, the fact is the best, fastest growing companies implement mm -hmm. the HR best practices. But I, I'm curious for your thoughts on that. Well, I would be very surprised if it's not causative. So I would be... You know, if you take a fast growing company that's currently has HR best practices and you choose to reduce them, to lay them off, to stop doing them, you're probably gonna get a lot of challenges with your employees. I mean, I remember what happened with Basecamp um, when they decided that, no, we're actually go not going to do these HR best practices. That was about a year ago. And they said, well, we're not going to it was something about their leadership didn't want to have conversations, didn't want to have a diversity inclusion plan, didn't want to have some HR support for their teams, and they're just going to focus on their work and not worry about this HR stuff. Yeah. And then so many people left <laughs> very quickly after that, that yeah. they lost a whole bunch of talented staff, and they were very surprised by how many people they lost. And yeah. that was a very clear example that, hey, you know, we can't just do you know, let's, let's say Silicon Valley and just hope that everything is going to be great just because we're all into tech and we'll all be working together well without caring about all this soft HR stuff, right? So right. that's a very clear example. But everything that goes on, it Google for let's take Google for example. Google at the beginning of its when it was developing, it didn't think it needed managers. And so it studied the question, do actual manage, good managers actually help or not? And it found that they were surprisingly useful to us. So their right. re research by Google, in-depth research on their managers, on the difference between, okay, if a manager is rated well by their employees, how well does that, do the employees do under that manager compared to another manager who's not rated so highly. And the manager, the employees under a highly rated manager perform much better. And then when employees are transferred to that manager, those employees do better compared to if they were working under a less well-rated manager. And yeah. so we've very seen specific case studies. We have, I don't know of a specific in-depth report like yours, but we see very specific case studies that do show that good HR practices matter. We don't know which of these HR practices necessarily matter. It might be the case that being a great manager is more important than having an exit interview. <laughs> but it might be the case that if the exit interview shows you what it means to be a good manager and which managers are not good, and then you can have performance conversations with those managers and improve right. their performance. So it's kind of hard to tell, right? <laughs> so tease those out. Yeah, it, it, when we we had a lot of internal discussions before publishing the, the results, and I think I think, and 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 I'm I'm leaving the, the world of data. This is my a, a hypothesis now, but I feel like implementing these best practices is or, is it reveals your intent and it reveals your heart as a manager, right? And, and go back to you know example. So if you're a, if you're a, a manager. Uh, and if you frequently write written development plans for each employee, that was one of the questions. Mm -hmm. 
strong correlation. 73% of fast growth companies do it, only 40% of down year companies. So a, a, a big spread on that question. And I got, and I got thinking, just because you did it doesn't mean you did it well. <laughs> you could sure. write a performance plan that sucks, <laughs> right? Yeah. Uh, but the fact that you're doing it, I think so says so much about your intent and your desire to, and in, employees feel this, that the mm -hmm. boss is invested in them. They care, yeah. right? And in this world, I know you've written a lot on virtual work. I, I, I've spoken on the what I call the the, the, the pending labor crisis um, because we're 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 entering. I, we have hit a tipping point that I think a lot of people don't realize that this labor shortage, the available workforce mm -hmm. based on birth rates and demographics, decided 30 years ago, uh, mm -hmm. and boomers retiring and all the the, the demographics of this thing, I think, have, yeah. have baked our situation today. This war for talent that was a, you know, a, a McKinsey a phrase 20 years ago for large enterprises mm -hmm. has now hit Main Street and, and Main Street is struggling to get talent. I think Main Street is going to continue to, to struggle to get talent. And it's I can't help but think that a lot of these HR best practices, even if you write that job description poorly, mm -hmm. the... Uh, uh, the 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 ad that you place online to recruit, even if you do it poorly, if mm -hmm. you write the performance review poorly, the fact that you do it and you're trying still separates mm -hmm. you from the people who aren't doing it at all, right? Uh, in 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 a, in a world where labor is going to continue to be more scarce, um, I, I just I just think that that becomes even more critical. In the data doesn't say it necessarily. You got to kind of combine and triangulate from some some of the macro trends, mm -hmm. but uh, I, I think that's an important component here. That makes sense. So let's talk about some of the, so you talked about the performance uh, community plan. I saw that the, one of the top things that well-performing companies do, 94% of the fast growth companies is communicating performance expectations to yep. uh, employees. Tell me a little bit more about what are the top indicators. Like, if there are three things that you should stop, that you should start doing, or three things you should stop doing, what are the top three things that you would suggest that the leaders listening to this podcast yeah. you would want them to think about if they're currently not doing? Yeah, it, it, it's really clear. So, um, what kind of jumped out to me is I as I broke down scores by the eight categories from pre-employment to post-employment. Mm -hmm. um, the poor performers, the shrinking companies on their best category was still worse than the lowest performance on any category for the high performers. So the high performers, mm -hmm. they do every category well. The low performers, there's three buckets that they perform the worst. Number one, the, the worst that they perform is development. They mm -hmm. are not developing their people. Number two is retention. Those To me, those two things go hand in hand. Right? Are are you working? Are you conducting stay interviews? <laughs> are you finding out what, what Gleb? What, what? Why would you want to stay working for me? What makes you happy? What are your goals? Simple questions like this, right? So develop mm -hmm. your employees, invest in retaining them, recognizing them, awarding them, uh, and then at the top of the funnel, recruiting. So recruiting the talent, developing the talent, retaining the talent. Those three had overwhelmingly mm -hmm. the biggest gaps. Areas like hiring, onboarding, compliance, offboarding. The, I would say the low performing companies didn't do good, but they did a lot mm -hmm. better. And in my mind, those, those areas of HR lend themselves to be a bit more tactical. Recruiting, mm -hmm. development, and retention, I think are much more strategic. So it, it speaks to the mindset. Do you view HR as an administrative task that mm -hmm. must be performed? There's a bunch of boxes to, to check to make sure the Department of Labor and the IRS and EEOC and others aren't up my shorts? Or mm -hmm. do you view HR from a strategic mindset? How am I going to recruit the very best employees? How am I going to develop them? How am I going to retain those employees? Mm -hmm. And of course, do so in a compliant way that I build an employment brand, right? Mm -hmm. To me, that's the, those are the three. It's recruiting, development, and retention. Well, that's very helpful. I think it'll be really help the audience think about those areas and as they check out more about your report. Are there any last words with which you wish to leave the audience as we wrap up, Mike? 
Yeah, well, I, I, I'm sure we can include it in show notes or something. We'll get everybody a link to to the ebook. Mm -hmm. uh, if not, hop on uh, SureSoftware.com. You'll you'll see plenty of uh, opportunities to download it. Um, you can unpack all the data, 38 pages uh, uh, filled with analysis and the actual questions and answers themselves. Really encourage everybody to do so. Uh, uh, and, and, and hopefully it helps to shape entrepreneur, small business uh, owners, executives of mid-sized companies, uh, their mind frame to, to mm. stop thinking about HR as a tactical box that must be checked and how to see it as a strategic, not department, but mm. way in which you conduct business. Excellent. Well, that's a great message on which to leave, Mike. Thank you very much for sharing your expertise and about the report. Yeah, enjoyed our conversation. Thank you. Mm. And thank you to the audience for checking out another episode of the Wise Decision Maker Show. Please make sure to subscribe wherever you check out the show and leave a review. It helps others discover the show and helps us improve the show. All right, everyone. I look forward to seeing you in the next episode of the Wise Decision Maker Show. In the meantime, the wisest and most profitable decisions to you, my friends.